All right. So, as uh, Brett mentioned, um, this is the last of our two talks <laughs> for planetary atmospheres. I expect to see more next year, guys. Seriously, planetary atmospheres are awesome. What I want to talk to you today about is um, mostly looking for life around other stars. And one of the best ways that we can do that is by using the Earth as an analog. And so the big picture here is that we have this big blue ball and we know that there's life on it. Conveniently, otherwise there would be no one here to listen to me talk. Now, we can use the Earth as a proxy by saying that life is here and we can see the signs for life all around us. And what we want to do is we want to take those signs for life and extrapolate them to other places in the universe. Uh, especially when what we're looking at is just the size of a pixel. So looking for terrestrial planets around other stars, this is about as much information as we're going to have any time in the next 100 years until we build some solar system sized telescope to resolve these terrestrial planets. Now, one of the biggest biosignatures in the terrestrial system is the oxygen that we are breathing now. It is predominantly formed by biology on the present Earth. And oxygen has been suggested as a biosignature for basically 50 years at this point. Uh, and it's had its ups, ups and downs. There have been some suggestion that uh, oxygen could have other abiotic sources. Um, but oxygen is wonderful because it has this big feature here at 0.76 microns that is uh, pretty deep and we could see that. So oxygen is visible uh, at about greater than 1% the present atmospheric level. So you can see this is 21% uh, oxygen, 1 PAL. And as you decrease oxygen, that feature kind of goes away. Now the nice thing is at low oxygen concentrations, ozone, which is a photochemical byproduct of oxygen, still stays visible. So about 0.1% PAL O2, you have a pretty substantial ozone feature out in the infrared. And so this is how we might detect oxygen in a planetary atmosphere. Now, like I mentioned before, some of the sources for oxygen, we have transient sources in the present Earth's atmosphere, including lightning. So if you take some water and CO2, nitrogen, add a bunch of electricity, you get NO and O2 and some hydrogen or CO. Um, this is remarkably short-lived because that uh, oxygen goes back to recombine with NO or with H2, uh, so it goes away fairly quickly. Another transient source is through CO2 photolysis. For example, in the upper atmosphere of the Earth, you can break apart CO2. That lone oxygen goes off and finds itself a dance partner and makes O2, which could linger in the upper atmosphere. Uh, more persistently, however, we have life, which takes water and CO2 and makes organic carbon, which is buried in sediments, and gaseous O2, which is allowed to accumulate in the atmosphere, or through hydrogen loss. So for example, early Venus, it probably lost most of its oceans through uh, the photolysis and subsequent loss of hydrogen to space, um, leaving behind large amounts of oxygen, uh, which subsequently reacted with the solid planet. It's gone today, um, although there is a little photochemical oxygen left over in the Venusian atmosphere. So if we're going to talk about oxygen as a biosignature, we need to, again, understand how it operates on the present Earth. And to do that, we need to look at oxygen through time. I showed this earlier in the intro, um, mostly as a self-serving motion. But uh, if you look at oxygen before the GOE, before the Great Oxidation Event, it is essentially zero. Um, the only sources of oxygen are going to be those transient or um, sources I mentioned before, so CO2 photolysis or lightning, so there's very little here. Uh, life, however, had different plans for the Earth's atmosphere, and so after the GOE, oxygen is suggested to have jumped to between 1 and 50 percent of modern. Now, there have been a number of recent suggestions that oxygen may have been lower. So if you uh, have read the 2014 Polonovsky et al. paper in Science, they suggest that the Proterozoic O2, so the oxygen level in here, uh, may have been in an order of magnitude or lower than, an order of magnitude or more lower than the previous estimates for Proterozoic oxygen. And so what this means is that 
we could, with a first generation terrestrial planet finder type telescope, look for oxygen and may have detected it at the canonical values for proterozoic oxygen, um, or looked in the infrared for the ozone feature, but really, it, the Earth could potentially be a planet without a significant biosignature for much of its history. So this is bad news if we want to look for life elsewhere. So this brings me to the crux of my question. What is a false positive? Now, as I mentioned before, the proterozoic oxygen right after the first jump up was fairly low. Um, so it could be that in some situations, the abiotic sources of oxygen actually produce more oxygen than the biotic sources did on the early Earth. And so any abiotic oxygen in excess of that proterozoic O2 is a false positive. Uh, and now I have to back away from this for a second and talk about some nuts and bolts, uh, just to give you guys a context for some of the things I will talk about towards the end of the talk. When we talk about chemistry in a terrestrial planetary atmosphere, what we really mean is that there's a whole slew of chemicals that are doing their own business in the atmosphere. And in the case of CO2, which I mentioned would be a big source of oxygen, if these uh, single oxygens could escape, um, CO and O plus M recombines those back into CO2. Or it would if that reaction wasn't spin forbidden. And so what happens is you could build up CO and O, those O's could go off to make oxygen, and we might see it that way. However, in the modern Earth's atmosphere um, and, and the early Earth's atmosphere, we actually have these catalytic cycles that are fueled by the products of water vapor photolysis. And so you can take CO and the hydroxyl radical and through a bunch of other intermediate reactions, you basically get a net result that is recombining CO and O. And this is very efficient in the present Earth's atmosphere. That's why we get very little abiotic O2 in the present atmosphere. Now, this is particularly important if we start talking about other stars. I know there's a lot of lines up here. Don't be scared. The present sun, the solar spectrum is here in the black. And you can see in this blow up that the, uh, the, near U, the far UV, which is, these are in nanometers, are, is here. And the far UV is here, the near UV is here. And there's actually a very different radiation environment for lower mass stars. So you can see here GJ876 is an M star, a middle M star. And this is AD Leo in gray, which is another middle M star. And those have very different radiation environments spanning this essentially uh, fairly arbitrary cutoff here. So you can see that they have comparable amounts of what I'm going to call far UV and uh, very different amounts of NUV, uh, uh, up to two orders of magnitude less near UV. And this is particularly important when we look at the photolysis cross-sections, the absorption cross-sections for some of the relevant species in the atmosphere. So short word here, we are getting still some uh, photolysis of water vapor and CO2, um, but long word than this, so into the near UV, it's predominantly water vapor photolysis. So that's that source of hydroxyl radical in an atmosphere. Now, what that means is that I'm going to transition to a slide. And well, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, so the model, in particular, worries about the atmosphere as a whole. And so we have to maintain global redox balance. And I'm not going to get into the details, because they're gory and kind of boring. So I'm going to skip over them and say that if we assume that there are no geologic sinks, for example, on 100 million year time scales, um, we can enforce atmospheric redox balance by assuming a return of reducing constituents to the atmosphere to balance the rain out of reducing and oxidizing species at the lower boundary. That's a bunch of jumble. You don't have to worry about it. If you have questions, come see me. The boundary conditions that uh, are imposed are not tunable parameters. They depend entirely on what you assume about the solid planet. So. Um, these cases here where we're uh, enforcing atmospheric redox balance, that is in the context of global assumptions. So I'm going to show you some results because that was kind of boring. What we have here is I've taken the Earth and I've plunked it around different types of stars. And so for the sun, in the absence of life, the oxygen mixing ratio at the surface is incredibly low. It's our abiotic levels. So like you saw before the GOE, the oxygen was essentially zero. 
Uh, for the F star, which is slightly brighter than the sun, so the habitable zone moves out, this terrestrial planet is nearly twice as far away from the sun as the Earth would be around the sun. The terrestrial planet around the F star is nearly twice as far away as it would be around the sun. But you can see that there's only slightly more oxygen in the upper atmosphere. Again, that's from that photolysis of CO2. But again, at the surface, there's not so much. What happens really is that around smaller stars where that radiation balance starts to change is that we see we start to get, um, for example, with the K star, which is slightly smaller than the sun, you start to see that the oxygen at the lower boundary, irrespective of what you assume about the oxygen sinks, the oxygen starts to build up. And in the case of the M stars, you get a range of values for oxygen based on your assumptions about the solid surface. So in the worst case scenario, where we assume that there are no oxygen sinks, which is likely unrealistic, we get a few percent oxygen at the lower boundary, which would be a detectable amount of oxygen. Um, in the cases where we assume that there is a, a large sink for oxidants, um, in, for example, the modern Earth, there's uh, organic matter, there's uh, ferric iron deposition and banded iron formations. So you could absorb a lot of that oxygen and actually draw it down to below that Planofsky et al. false positive threshold I had suggested before. Um, and so to get back to this balance between the near U, the far UV, the far UV and the near UV, um, what we can say about what's driving the amount of oxygen is really this far UV to near UV ratio. And so if you plot these values for the stars based on their integrated uh, FUV and near UV um, fluxes, you can see that the M stars plot way up here with uh, the amount of oxygen being controlled by the amount of uh, the ratio of FUV to NUV. Um, and the, the G and the F star is down here, and the K star is sort of in the middle, because it had a middling amount of oxygen. Um, but if you take the solar flux, and you actually you decrease the NUV, so if you decrease the NUV, we're coming over this way, you can see that the oxygen actually builds up and, and falls quite nicely along the other values for these stars. And so, in conclusion, I'd like to suggest that there is little O2 or ozone around F and G type stars, um, that there's a modest and potentially detectable amount of O2 around K type stars, and detectable O2 around M stars in some cases, e.g. if there are no surface sinks for O2. Uh, and this is a, uh, a lovely suite of spectra that uh, Eddie Schwederman has put together from uh, UW. Um, so not this UW, the other UW. Um, and you can see that, that uh, for example, that ozone feature in the UV uh, is pretty strong for the M star, uh, and that oxygen feature at 0.76 microns is pretty strong too. Um, and so I'm going to leave that up. I'm going to take questions. Questions for Sonny? Excellent. I'm going to ask a naive question then. Uh, so are you suggesting just that the takeaway is that if we have a detection around an F or a G type star, then that's probably fairly secure that it's biotic and not abiotic? I would argue that if you do detect oxygen around an F or a G type star, that it would likely be from a biological source. OK. Um, of course, the, the gold standard biosignature is oxygen in combination with some other reducing gas, for example, nitrous oxide. Um, there are very few and very small sources, abiotic sources of N2O. So those two together would be a good biosignature. Any other questions? Otherwise, we're right on time. I guess we're right on time. Cool. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Sonny, again.